from his experience in technology and in teaching by, by doing what he does. And you also have your own blog, which is a classic type of blog on, on uh, philosophy, cross-cultural, right? Yeah, yeah cross-cultural philosophy. And Matt is an assistant professor at Bridgewater State University, got his degree in philosophy at UT Austin. Um, works on Indian philosophy, especially, I think, cognition and skepticism, right? But well, yeah, uh, epistemology, theory theory epistemology in general. Yeah. 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 And uh, uh, he's done lots of, lots of, uh, you know, lots of presentations and uh, published lots of articles in collective volumes and other things on, on, on subjects of Indian philosophy, especially. And so I'm really worried about that. I mean, I mean, thank, thank you for, for hosting this. I uh, appreciate this, this chance to get out. I will. Yeah, actually, I might grab a glass of water. Yeah, bottle's great. It's harder to knock over. So, um, all right, so I want to just before before I start on anything, um, say say I, I always consider the questions to be the most interesting part of a talk, um, and I think Matt Matt and I have talked, and we we both do see this as a talk, not as a paper to be read. Um, so you know, it, it's hopefully as as at least something of a dialogue, and um, you know, you don't need to wait till the end to ask questions. Um, if you have any question at any points, feel free to to raise your hand. If I'm in the middle of something, I might say you know I'll, I'll get to that or something, but. Um, you know, we expect to interrupt each other at some point too, as well. So, um, feel feel free. Um, so, one one of the things that that I that I've found particularly important in the kind of larger dialogue around the digital humanities is, or some, maybe something I found a little even frustrating is that when people talk about digital humanities, a lot of the time they're they're talking about quantitative methods, um, you know, computation and visualization, um, analyze hundreds of texts together, math out connections, um, which is, is very useful, but in some respects I think it's more like social science than like the humanities as, as traditionally conceived. Um, and so, the, the kind of problematic I'm setting setting up here is do digital tools have anything to offer a field like philosophy? Um, you certainly can do computation and visualization with respect to philosophy. I actually have a site that I've um, set up that, that I've set up that way. Um, it's just sort of more, more as an experiment than anything else, but I'll just show you here. This is a um, This is a site that I've set up with a software called called MediaCron through uh, through Boston College, um, and it offers kind of maps and timelines, um, so you can you can sort of see connections you know um, between different ph philosophers uh, historically around the world. You know you can see how close Nietzsche and Heidegger were to each other, and um, sort of look at you know look at kind of who were who were rough contemporaries, um, and so on, um, but. I think the, the, the thing about uh, a project like that is that really, I mean, traditionally that would be more what's considered intellectual history rather than, than philosophy. Um, I think R Randall Collins did a book that I really like that was sort of analog work um, that was in that vein a few decades ago, but he called it the sociology of philosophies, and that's really what it is. It's, it's not doing philosophy, it's doing sort of a, a study of philosophy from the, from the outside. Um, and so the the and, and that kind of history of philosophy does play a role in, in philosophical work, as I think you know classicists know. Um, but it's but philosophy really is above all based on careful interpretation and discussion of, of individual ideas and texts. Um, and I, I think you know English language analytic philosophy often doesn't even go that far, it's just sort of analyzing contemporary arguments about philosophical topics like the, the nature of knowledge or, or of morality. Um, but so the question is, do digital tools have something to offer philosophy in either of these senses, um, interpreting texts or, or analyzing arguments? And, and our answer is yes. And I suppose that, that introduction ki kind of is, is maybe something I didn't need to say to people who work for the Perseus Project, uh, because, they're, they're, because that, that was sort of going to be my, my sort of one, one exception of, of, you know, place where, yes, there is something um, obvious to offer there. And then, you know, you can offer the, these, the Greek versions with all the hypertext of the and so on. Um, so that I think is one some, one genuine uh, contribution of, of the digital humanities to philosophy. But I think there's another key side beyond that, which which is communication. 
um, which I think is, is particularly important for constructive philosophical work, where we're not only rereading past texts, but also through one way or another trying to take their ideas forward into the future. Um, and there, I think there's no substitute for conversation. Right? That's such a key methodological element of, of philosophy, whether it's Socrates and Plato meeting in the Agora, or the, the Buddha and his Jain and Najivika counterparts wandering and preaching the same audience, or um, Schelling and Hegel discussing idealism in their dorm room. Right? The, the phil philosophical ideas are really stimulated by encounters with other philosophical ideas. Um, that is one of Collins's points in the, in the sociology of philosophies, is that so much of it comes out of social networks. And digital networks allow a meeting of the minds that might otherwise not have taken place. Um, you know, on that, that uh, Mediacron site, you can see Mencius and Aristotle, yeah, share that again. Uh, <laughs> they always. <laughs> yeah, it's. They're dropped more than used. Yeah, when, when, when a, and anybody making a, a presentation on technology, inevitably the technology goes wrong <laughs> one way or the other. It's just kind of an iron law. Uh, so, but but you know you can see. I mean, Mencius and, and Aristotle were were rough contemporaries. Um, they were both around 325 BCE. But they couldn't have even imagined meeting each other, or even being aware that each other existed, because they were at the far ends of, of Eurasia. But now scholars can actually interact directly with each other across distances even even greater than that. Um, and so the question is, well, what kind of tools will best facilitate that? And until the the last decade, I think probably the, the answer was still mostly journals, right? That that was that's kind of been our traditional tool, um, and that. A sort of venerable tool that been around since the kind of colonial age that the print journals could circulate around the world, and you know, since then we've taken them online as well. A lot of journals, um, for one thing, they don't have the the immediacy of conversation, and there's something that's sort of, sort of lost. Um, but beyond that, I think most of are probably with the the problems of academic publishing. Uh, the, the cost of journals is sort of spiraling ever upward, along with bundling and restricted permissions so that you know, most libraries, let alone individuals, can't afford to subscribe. Um, and the budgets get, and, and their budgets will start to keep getting reduced for, for monographs and, and small publishers. That problem, I think, is particularly acute for the study of classical India, um, as opposed to cla classical Europe, because there are so many potential readers who are in India, um, and their budget tends to be much more challenging than even you know graduate students in in Europe. Um, I um, you know they can't afford even prices we would consider modest. I, I met um, a reader of of my blog in in India, a young young man around around uh, 21, um, and we were talking about uh, Motilal Banarsidas, which is this this company that that produces kind of knockoff reprints of uh, books in 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 Indian philosophy. Um, you know, a, bo a book that a book that would uh, that would cost um, you know, maybe maybe eighty dollars here. Um, they'll do uh, a cheap reprint of it in, in India for for ten bucks, for you know, the equivalent of ten bucks if you buy it in India. Then um, he was saying like, oh, but I can't buy multiwell books; they're so expensive. You know, I, um, for when when you're when you're on that typical you know middle class Indian salary, um, e even even a relatively cheap book is is fairly expensive. You know, let alone the cost of of these academic journals that charge ever higher subscriptions. So for that reason, I think in the in, um, study of classical India, the, the promise of, of open access is particularly important. We have scholarly work that's available to all. Um, the key problem of, of open access is, is cost versus quality control. If you have any significant costs, they have to be paid somehow. So there are some open access resources that now even charge their authors because that's the only way that they can think of to make money. Um, and I think you know when at a time when the academic job market is so cutthroat, there are many who would argue that's even worse than the the existing model uh, in terms of its, its fairness. So, in a sense, we we wanting to we're trying to think about alternative experiments. Are there ways you can have both quality and low cost? Um, you know, off, and you know, Matt was pointing out often open. We think of open access. Sort of repository that university might have of published papers, um, but all of that I, I say to provide context for let's go, um, and especially our, our case 
to be blocked. So this is the blog, what, what it looks like, and I'll say more about it. Um, we want to start in, in terms of this wider context. The, the key advantage of the blog is that costs are negligible. Um, right? if, if you leave aside the, if, um, the, the cost of, of computer and internet access for users, I mean, and in, in a place like India, that might be, th those, those costs might be there, but at least at a, at a non-broadband level, which, which is fine when all you're reading is text, um, people are likely to have computer and internet access even in a third world country, um, at least if they're educated enough to be reading English language scholarship in the, in the first place. Um, you know, even if you can't, even if you can't afford uh, to buy $10 books, you probably still have some sort of, of internet connection that will let you read text. There's cyber cafes everywhere now. Right, exactly. Yeah, you can get it through. You can get it through an internet cafe. Um, you know, you might be able to get it through your institution or, but, but either way, it's, it's, it's a cost that, that is, more affordable than than books. Um, so that you know that's the that's the only cost for for readers, um, and then the the only other cost really involved is server space. Um, and with the Indian Philosophy Blog, I can tell you it's six dollars a month. Um, and you know I have a salary comparable to a professor's, um, so I can afford that without thinking about it. Um, you know I was already paying that for my personal blog anyway. So there's literally no additional cash outlay for this blog. Um, so that so you know the the con in the Indian philosophy blog is 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 nothing basically it's um, a, an open access resource that's that's just out there and available. So the big potential problem though is you get what you pay for right money money very often money money matters because if you have money you can hire editors proofreaders community managers you can even pay contributors um, without money you can do none of those things and. A lot of free internet content. Probably, let's. I'll go out on a list. Most internet content has a quality problem. I, I, I think you know. I, I if you if you've ever the comments section on YouTube, I'm sorry. Um, you know, it, it, what's that? Good. You're you're you're. Yeah. <laughs> just just you know. There's there's that whole like Twitter. Yeah. I do teach yeah. my students in critical thinking that YouTube comments are a good way to develop the capacity to follow the first rule of arguing with a fanatic, which is don't. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, it's you. You see, you know, just sort of you know, ran, random people when when random people to to contribute sort of whatever whatever they feel like without any expertise or anything, then you know the result can can be imagined. Um, you know, and this and this can apply even in scholarly situations. Um, you notice the the American Philosophical Association, the main uh, organization for scholars, recently set up a group on LinkedIn. Um, everyone and is not moderate, and the results are kind of what one might expect of that. Yeah, I mean, half of it seems to be spam, and the other half is ungrammatical. Um, <laughs> the spam's pretty ungrammatical too, but um, <clears throat> you know, it. it it's not something that that is a use to to scholars of philosophy. Um, Wikipedia, you know, has some quality controls method, but um, there remain some problems. And in, in in particular, um, for for this field, Wikipedia articles on India tend to have a fairly strong Hindu nationalist slant. Um, because those are the people who have time to write and edit Wikipedia entries about India. That's sort of how it's worked out. And monitor um, them with, with strict, like, and monitor them to make sure that if there are additions, that somehow other they'll, they'll respond to them. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So that, so that, so you know, I I look at some of these pages that that say pretty inaccurate or at least extremely slanted things, and and I think you know I would love to provide some balance on that, but I sure don't have time to to do that. Um, especially when you know there are people who will revert everything and sort of try and get you into that that sort of flame war over it. Um, so so those are all problems there. And 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 with the Indian philosophy blog, what we really wanted to do was create a community of scholars. You know, not necessarily professors, but people who knew what they were talking about, so that the information would be trustworthy. Um, we do allow anybody to comment as long as they they follow 
the the rules that are that are set out, and we haven't had a whole lot of problem with that so far. Um, but the rules are there in case we do. Um, but to contribute a post, um, someone need, needs needs to be pre-approved in advance so that the information is is trustworthy. Um, you know, there we can't pay editors, so the quality control we have comes from pre-selecting and screening contributors. So um, anyone, anybody can comment if they follow the rules, but the posts need our, our prior approval. So ev everyone who is writing on the blog um, and posting either has or is in the process of getting a, a PhD uh, in, in, the, in a related field. And so what that means is relatively little labor is required on our part to run it. You know, we, don't have to, we don't have to approve posts in advance. We trust the contributors to provide quality content because of their cr credentials. So the, the story uh, of the Indian philosophy blog, um, the idea was, was shared between me and an Italian philosoph uh, philosophy scholar named Elisa Freschi, whom I've never met. Um, I don't think I even know what she looks like. We, we met through a very short-lived email list in Asian thought. Um, it, was, it came out of, I think, the, the Society for Asian and Comparative Philosophy is a, a group that, that study, studies a, um, Asian philosophy. It's sort of less... Um, less well known, I think, than, than the, the American Philosophical Association, the American Academy of Religion, partially, I think, because no job listings are, are run through it. So, so it's sort of an optional uh, society in, in that sense. But it's not unlike the SAGP, like the Society for Aging Philosophy. Right, Asian. right. Yeah, or the American Oriental Society, you know, those, those, kind, those kind, kinds of groups that are scholarly associations that are people, are, people are part of just for scholarship's sake, not because they're desperately scrambling uh, for, for a foothold in the, the job market. But you know, so that, that makes them smaller, but still uh, of interest. And so um, there was one, one uh, scholar at the SACP who set up this mailing list called, called Asian Thought L, um, that he, he was hoping to be, to be kind of a resource for um, people to, to share ideas about, about South Asian or East Asian philosophy. Um, and you know, I, I posted on that a, a couple of times, but um, for whatever reason, the, the interest just wasn't sustained. It didn't have people with, with an investment in it to keep it up. But one thing that really did come out of it is that um, Elisa and I got to, got to know each other that way. Um, and I mentioned to her my, my personal blog. I'll show you now. Um, I'd say personal uh, to, to distinguish it from the, the Indian philosophy blog, but it, but it is also a scholarly blog um, of a sort. Um, this is called uh, called Love of All Wisdom, um, and you know, the the, the title. I think you know the the reason behind the title should probably be, be fairly obvious. That it, it's a blog in cross cultural philosophy um, across multiple traditions. So I, I try and think with with Indian philosophy, Chinese philosophy, Greek, German. Um, you know, bo both both sort of interpretively, but also kind of constructively to try and build a, a project of philosophy more more generally. Um, this is. It's the kind, the kind of, uh, of sort of wide-ranging work that I had long wanted to do, and had hoped you know that would be the kind of work that I would do once I got tenure. Um, you know, be, because you know while you while you're scrambling to get tenure, you can't go this wide. You have to focus on your your narrow slice of everything. Um, you know you can't try and you can't try and be Hegel. You can't try and be Plato and have this sort of synoptic view of of, of everything that's out there because you know you have to you have to specialize in order to to fit. The, the department's needs. So, you know, that's what, and that's kind of my um, my story is that you know I was on the the academic job market for uh, two or three years and left it for all the reasons you can imagine. Um, and when I did leave it, that was it was kind of, it, it, it in some ways it was a blessing in disguise. It was sort of I mean a, a mixed blessing, but you know. Um, a big part, a big part of the the benefit was that I could I could live where I wanted to be. But it also meant that um, even though I had less time to write uh, as a scholar, I could write what I wanted to write. And so this this blog really really came out of that. You know that I can I can talk about texts that are written in languages I don't read because I have access to a translation. Um, and you know that's. That's that's something that um, you know plenty of people have done in the history of philosophy. You know, Aquinas didn't know much Greek, but was one of the great Aristotle scholars. Um, but you know, you can't really do that professionally now. Um, you know, and, and I recognize this doesn't get recognized in 
scholar in sort of scholarly venues, but um, it was really something that I just felt called to do, and I've sustained this for for five years now. And Elise, and so getting back to Elise uh, Presky, she um, she she's been a regular commenter on on this blog um, and expressed a lot of interest in it, and sort of said, you know, well, I I wish you'd write more about about Indian philosophy because there's just so little about Indian philosophy on the 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 internet, and and thought, you know, maybe we could start a group blog in Indian philosophy, and I thought, well, that's that's a great idea, you know, get get people together, um, especially there's an inspiration for that um, in another blog that started. I think right around the same time as Love of All Wisdom, maybe a little bit before, um, so kind of mid O's, uh, called Warp, Weft, and Way. And I'll just pull that up here. It's that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, this, this is a group blog in Chinese philosophy uh, by Professor Manuel M., um, who has been a professor at Fairfield University in Connecticut about since about the time that um, and it was and it was about the same time that I was on the the market, um, and many uh, and many of the the bigger names in uh, Chinese philosophy contribute to it. I've got the long list of uh, biographies here, um, and. Um, it's yet yeah, become become quite quite influential in their regular posts, and um, we thought you know this this seems this seems like a model people are are willing to to follow and participate in, in in Chinese philosophy, and you know what if we did something like that in Indian philosophy? So it took us a while to to you know get off our butts and actually do it, but we did, um, and then I think the the biggest thing was to invite contributors to the the blog. We we basically began with. With a list of people that we that we knew and, and thought about wanting to invite, um, but, you know, sort of people who we thought were were we were basically junior scholars in the field. We kind of wanted to to have it be um, sort of start with junior scholars uh, as, as people who kind of participate as equals, um, and then possibly invite the senior scholars later on once the the junior scholars already have the discussion. And part, you know, partially so they could contribute as equals, partially also because junior tech, junior scholars tend to be more interested in, in online venues when they're not already sort of set in their, their ways. Um, so we each kind of drew up a list of, of people that we knew. Um, and there was only one person who was on both Elisa's list and mine, and that was Matt. Um, and so we, we uh, decided we'd invite him as a, as a third co-founder and we kind of shared our, our ideas together. Um, so we got, we got the community together. and. Then we were happy to find that um, once we had gotten this community started, uh, others asked to join. Um, there, there were there were other junior scholars and even senior scholars who asked to become participants. It really attracted several scholars who were not previously involved in any sort of open access initiatives. Uh, you know, I was particularly pleased. I, I just read um, this really wonderful book uh, called Unifying Hinduism by by Andrew Nicholson. It's a professor at at Stony Brook, a junior professor. I was, I was like, wow, this is um, this is a, a really incredible book. The, the way the way it sort of goes really deep into texts that note that nobody's read, and uses them to make a wider point about the, the history of Indian philosophy and the, the way that there's more continuity between the pre-colonial past and the and the colonial and post-colonial periods than people have previously thought. Uh, so the, sort of the, the upshot of it. And it was re really impressive work, and then um, found a, a, an email from popping up from him in my inbox saying, "I want I, I want to join this blog." This, this blog. So it was like that was a big sign for me that we you know, it was something really we we really had something here. And I think really I I, I would have to say that the blog has has been a success. It's really become uh, a major resource for discussions of philosophy in classical India, um, and I. And I also want to talk about why I think it's been a success. You know, we, we have we have right reg, reg, regular contributions. You know, um, see uh, some some of our posts get a lot of get a lot of replies. You know, um, just we get you know twelve you know twelve comments here, um, and we, we, you know, we and we and you can see on the, the um, let's just go back to the February here. You know, if you look at the the number of days a month we we've ha we've had posts. You know, probably we've got probably an average of three or four a week. Um, so so people so people regularly regularly posting. Um, so I, I um so I think it's been a success, and I and I want to say a bit more about why it's been a success. 
um, so that others you know, who are thinking about digital initiatives can can learn from that. So I'm going to say a few words about that, and then and then uh, Matthew will say some more from his perspective. So questions: How how do you make something like this uh, effective and successful? Um, first thing, I think WordPress is just a great platform for, for this sort of thing. Um, I started out with with uh, Love of All Wisdom on WordPress um, when I was setting when I was setting that up. Uh, it was you know 2009. I was sort of thinking, well, I want to start a blog. I don't know anything about starting a blog. Let's just go and sort of read how you do this. People mentioned, oh, you know, there, there are a couple of, couple of platforms. You know, you can use Blogger and Blogspot, um, but WordPress has this sort of range where you where you can go from. Um, you know, this hosted service at WordPress.com to um, your own to your own uh, site on, on your own server, um, and so you have got this flexibility because it's such open source software. So I thought, well, okay, so I'll go with WordPress. And I started out writing this on WordPress.com. Almost immediately decided to move it to my own server uh, because at, at the time WordPress.com was less flexible. You couldn't uh, hook your own domain name up to it. Um, you had much less flexibility and customizability with themes and templates and so on. I think I think WordPress.com you know, has opened up more of that now. Uh, it's become a more viable option. But um, I decided I would get my own my own server. And I started out with uh, it's a Bluehost, and it was called Just Host, um, which was a, which was a site that um, it's one of, one of it's one of those you know uh, I, I don't think they promised it. I mean, they had promised unlimited server space, and I think it was like three bucks a month or, so, or something like that. Um, and that was unfortunately a, a you get what you pay for situation because after after maybe a year or so of working on them, they immediately shut my site down and said your your traffic is, is, is too high. It's time to move to a dedicated server that will cost you one hundred and twenty dollars a month. Um, and so ba basically, like th those options tend to be a little fly by night. Um, and I asked so I, I asked a, a friend of mine, you know, where where do you where do you go for you know you you know, to text savvy friend who'd done some digital humanities work. Um, he said, well, you know, I, I had a blog. I've always hosted it on, on a company called Verve Hosting out of, out of Britain. Um, you know, they're, they, you know they, they're reliable to six bucks a month. And, um, you know, they, they don't promise anything like unlimited server space. And any, anybody that promises something like that is, is, is probably a scam artist. Um, so I moved to them, and, and that's been where, where it, it was hosted ever since. And I, I think, you know, nowadays, I mean, Amazon Web Services is, is a pretty popular um, option, and I think would would do fine. But you know, um, I think sort of generally the principle is is you know, don't go with something that looks too good to be true, um, and you'll be you'll be set. So I so I hosted um, Love of All Wisdom on that site, and then since I already had a WordPress installation, it was just a matter of, kind of making it into a multi-site installation. And so now um, Love of All, and so Indian Philosophy Blog is hosted in the same place. Uh, so again, no no extra costs at all. Um, and so, so, and I think you know, having that personal blog has probably helped the experience of Indian philosophy blogs. There are some things that I, I knew about what were necessary. Um, one of the big important things I think for a successful community is you, you do need to have some rules. Um, I we we start, started the Indian philosophy blog with rules, um, which I originally didn't start Love of All Wisdom with. Um, I, I originally just sort of you know trust, trusted my my contributors and sort of put, trusted commenters to to. Uh, kind of play nice, um, but then there was an experience with uh, one commenter who um, was actually is actually you know is is a real scholar is somebody that that I met at the Society for Asian Comparative Philosophy conference has a PhD in philosophy is a professor at a, at a community college, um, but nevertheless was something of a troll. Um, he met many of his, his posts were uh, tended to take a very uh, uh, an angry tone, um, and they and they would often actually reach into the level of insults and personal attacks. Um, you know, there there was uh, and you know of course there, there's always that joke about why are academic politics so vicious because the stakes are so small, um, and that certainly seemed to be the case. There was one post where, where he got into a debate with another commenter about Wittgenstein's prose style. Um, and over that, they started throwing these insults back and forth, calling calling each other the, the, the you know um, their, their mean names. And 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 I and I said no, like you got you got to lay off this. Um, in, in a more general case, mm -hmm. if I may. So I think I mean you're bringing up good examples, but mm -hmm. if, to go to any of the major disciplinary blogs in philosophy tends to be a depressing experience, right? It tends to be kind of like gossipy. It tends to be people basically complaining about what they don't like. But there's a place for that. But most people I know uh, that I kind of, whose sensibility, I guess you could say, in, in my field, whose sensibility I can sympathize with and relate to, 
make a point of saying I tend not to go to the blogs ex unless I just want to follow through on whether the latest scandal I heard about was actually accurate. You know right. what I mean? So we, we had a point of just saying from the beginning, we want to have a very different tone. And I think the rules are kind of a function of that, and it's worked out pretty well. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I, and I, I think, um, you know, one, one of the surprising things, you know, again, with it, just a little bit more about that that experience, you know, this this particular, um, with, with this particular uh, person I have difficulty with, um, there was a point where there started sprouting up a number of other people who were commenting and kind of agreeing with him and, and, and taking a, a, that nasty tone as well. And, I, and I, I saw, you know, I sort of said, you know, like, please, you know, as, as I started saying, okay, please lay off of this and, or, or I will, um, or, or I will need to restrict your participation on the site. I went in to, to look for, for their IP addresses so that I could ban them. And sure enough, they all had the same IP address. Um, it was the same guy who was just posting under multiple aliases to give the impression of ganging up. Um, Which is not uncommon to actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, so that so that that was a, a really a, a lesson learned. Um, so we decided, we, okay, so we need we need some rules here. Um, and you know, I, I had I had a set of set of rules on my blog that are fairly wordy. Um, and I think we did a, we did a nice thing on the Indian philosophy blog. There's um, we drew the inspiration for our rules from another blog called uh, Language Log. And uh, where are they? Yeah, yeah, their comments rules. So they have they have this nice way of uh, uh, having for long posts and summing them up in sort of two words: be brief, be relevant, be informed, be polite. Um, and so we, we we didn't we didn't pick those rules exactly, but we modeled our rules on them. So um, so ours came down to be polite, be relevant, be scholarly. Right. The um, you know, be polite, the, sort of the obvious ones, you know, if you must attack, attack the argument, not the person. Um, be relevant, meaning, you know, we don't want to get into extended discussions that are, that are off the topic of South Asian philosophy. And then be, be scholarly, as in, you know, don't have some connection to, to the scholarly apparatus and support your claims. Interestingly, um, this third one, I think, there's more of a danger in the history of Indian philosophy than, let's say, uh, classical or ancient Greek philosophy, because mm -hmm. um, you do have people who are like living adherence to religious traditions, which somehow or other trace themselves to some of the thinkers we're talking about. And there's pressure to somehow this kind of uh, like guru groupism right. may come in in ways that may not be as prominent in other ways. So, yeah. So what do you mean by be scholarly? I mean, citations. Uh -huh. Give appropriate citations for your so that's what it says that I just got really Yeah, clear. largely. I mean, it basically, yeah. what we, the point we try to make there is that, in, is, I'm sorry, do you want to? No, go ahead. So, um, you know, blog writing, and this is part of kind of the kind of the meta issue that we're thinking about and kind of is coming up in this discussion is, is there a way that blog writing functions as an academic resource? And we say yes. But naturally, it might be a little bit more prima facie and provisional and kind of tentative than something right. that's going to be printed in a paper or printed in a journal. And so we want to strike the right tone. Yes, you can put out prima facie ideas, but you still have to motivate it by appeal to contemporary literature and classical literature. So that sort of thing. Right. right. And we and we don't and we don't insist on an, on like a formal scholarly apparatus. You know, you don't you don't have you don't have to give you know name, publication, year, etc. Et, et cetera. Just sort of you I mean, just sort of you know, men, men should, you know if you if you're about, it's about research standards. Exactly. Right. Exactly. exactly. It's, and, and incidentally, even if we're not strict about it, there are a number of contributors who make a point that anything they cite, they do put a little right. apparatus at the end. Right. And that, that, that's optional. You know, I, I mean, you know, if, if they want to do that, that's great. Um, but if, if but it's it's more it's more a point of uh, of of like, well, you know, if you claim that such and such is is Nagarjuna's view, then like. Give us some text of, of Nagarjuna is where he actually says that, and you right. know, just you know, cite chapter and verse or whatever. You know. And in a way, like at a, at a at a panel presentation or whatever, in the crucible of conversation, you're going to be called to the mat if you have claim. Right. So the comments tend to say, "Okay, follow up. I don't think he says that." Or, I mean, again, in a tone that we think is appropriate, but that that some of the pressure comes from the comments. It doesn't have to come on high from us as the moderator. Right. And I think, and one of the things that I think Matthew will be talking about, and and um, I think it's been sort of helpful is that in 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 a way I I feel like that there's um, the content on the blog is, is comparable in a way to a conference presentation, right? That when you're when you're making when you're making a conference presentation, you know you're not you're not going to you're not going to to stop your presentation to to footnote it and say you know Smith comma John 2012 um, name name of article you you know you, that that's that's sort of 
but the idea is that that's assumed, right? That when you're making a, when you're making a conference presentation, you know, you won't necessarily like put in the whole official apparatus. But the idea is that if someone calls you on it and, and says like, well, you know, does it really say that? You know, then, then you'll be able to say, well, this is where I got that from. Um, and so, so that's really kind of the the key about why and what what we mean by be scholarly and and how that that works here. Um, and we, we also have, um, I mean, the other thing that, that I think was quite important with the rules, which I hadn't originally thought about, um, it was not an issue on my individual blog, it was here, is how do, how do we enforce them in the sense of who decides when these rules have been broken? Um, and let me, let me just get on, to the, uh, hold on a second. Um, we decided to leave that up to the, we decided to leave that up to the discretion of the, the person who made the post. Um, so there's actually there, we do we do have one person who kind of regularly make, makes comments and is is in something of this groupy mode that you're talking yeah. about. He's, he's, a, he's a big follower of. Uh, really be careful just in case we link to this from the blog. Yeah, no, that's that's fair. <laughs> uh, but you know, he, I mean, he is. He has you know, that kind of what's called guru bhakti in Sanskrit. Right. Uh, deep devotion to the guru. Yeah, he's he's a, he's a follower of, of Sri Aurobindo, <laughs> the 20th century Indian Indian philosopher, and and um, very kind of. Uh, you know, enthusiastic. Think, think, yeah, very enthusiastic um, in, in many senses of that word, enthusiasm. Um, and um, there and there have been some disagreements about how to how to deal with with his posts. I I I, I welcome his posts on. Or I welcome his comments on on my posts. Um, I think I think that's you know it's it's not a perspective that I necessarily get a lot out of. Sometimes I mean, sometimes his posts his comments have been have been valuable to me. Sometimes not. Um, but um, you know, there's an, another another uh, poster who who basically, who basically said like, you know, I don't I don't have the patience for that kind of thing. This is not scholarly. Um, and so so th so that poster was it was able to was a you know had the leeway to say you know don't don't make comments like that here. So that so that's a particular way that we're enforcing it is is it's up to the person who makes the post to decide whether comments on it are are okay. Sorry. I, I, oh, we have a question from a remote. Oh yeah, cool. How many hours a week or day do you spend monitoring the blog? Um, not many. Um, I mean, t I mean, when it comes when it comes to comments, um, you know, WordPress has the the feature that typically the first time somebody posts um, you know, from a typical from a given IP address or alias, you have to say approve their their comment, um, and then once they're approved, they can they can then it's sort of they can keep going unless you specifically say not to. Um, so you know, I, I get notifications in my in my email inbox about that, um, and um, typically by the time I get to the site to approve somebody's new comment, it's already been approved. You know, there's three of us working yeah. together, and Yo. without really without any tension or, or having to sit down like with a spreadsheet and fill out the hours, it's been very long. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I, I think you know that we. If we did have to deal with somebody who was kind of on that that borderline, um, can I get some fries with that shake? What? <laughs> Can I get some fries with that shake? Uh, wait. Hi. Um, there's uh, there's uh somebody named Ryan who is in this hangout. Um, yes. I was like, what the fuck? He's just trolling or something. Yeah. yeah. Okay. How do how do uh I'm. Um. By the way, I'm sorry about that. Hi, from broadcasting. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll just. I'll. I'm really I'll, sorry, bro. Okay. All right. Have a nice night. Oh, a jet. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that was. <laughs> I think <laughs> it, it, if I understand what was happening, though, it's possible that that person was actually doing something else at the same time. I don't know if they were actually trolling. I think yeah. He, yeah. He also might have. I don't think he was trolling. I think he accidentally clicked on the because it's on. It's. Live on YouTube right now. Right. So maybe he ended up on the YouTube video and then. He's earned his he's earned his fifteen minutes. So, <laughs> do you want to? Sorry, okay. I just. I just. Wait, you hear how many people are watching? Just one. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay, but we'll have the link up afterwards, so we'll probably yeah. get more yeah, people looking strong. afterwards. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So um. So the. the and the the quite the question again was um, how many hours you would spend right how many right and and so yeah so the, the answer is is not much I mean typically there's pro I mean probably more time spent um, 
kind of kind of adding new accounts and um, generating new content. Yeah, and you know, and if we if we and if, if we're kind of changing the structure of the blog, you know, if we're adding through book reviews or, or something, if there's if there's sort of some new way we're doing it, um, that tends to take up more time than than the kind of the day to day business of moderation is really not a, a lot of the time, and that's that's important because I mean, um, you know, one of, one of the big things uh, uh, about it was you know we didn't have. You didn't have a lot of money to, to spend spend on this, so you know we uh, had zero. But we also didn't have a lot of time. Um, you know, I, I would have been, I, you know, spend, spend you know spending a couple hundred dollars of my money on this a year would be a lot easier than than spending you know ten hours a week on it. So um, that that's that's a, a, an issue as well. But it's it hasn't. It hasn't been that much of an issue, um, you know. I mean, I, I wind up I wind up doing some uh, sort of tech support for it, but I mean, I, that's one of the nice things about being an educational technologist is I do WordPress support at, at work as well, so I, I have some some background for that. But you know, I mean, WordPress is it's a it's a fairly stable system. It doesn't require a whole lot of, of uh, TLC that way. And so that was our kind of a process that we settled on to to have uh, to have rules, and we we used a similar process to think of our our. Uh, Structure of categories for posts. Um, that you know, I, I that was something that I recognized from my own blog. You can, when you when you have a blog that goes on for a while, categories and or tags are really essential because because if people want to find posts on a topic, they don't want to have to like scroll through everything that's been there. Um, so we basically agreed, you know, on a, on a bunch of on a bunch of topics. There are a couple of things like methodology. Um, you know, philology and uh, things like announcements, but you know, really, our our category there were kind of two kinds of, of categories. Um, we wanted to make sure to have categories for the schools of Indian philosophy, um, and, that, that, and that may be something that's kind of um, particular to to um, Indian philosophy in a way is that there are more. You know, I mean, in, in Western philosophy, people will talk about things like like German idealism or you know the Peripatetics or or something, but um, it's less sort of standard. It's more standard for people to kind of divide things up by thinker than by by school. Um, whereas in in Indian philosophy, the, the the sort of traditional way to go about it is there are these systems of philosophy. O often it's sort of said there are six systems of orthodox Hindu philosophy is the sort of um, way of that. And I think there's something problematic with probably every word in that sentence. Um, but um, but that's sort of the the way that it's been it's been kind of thought of. So so it was sort of natural to sort of Expand it and say, you know, we're not going to necessarily divide. We're not, not going to use the word Hindu or, or Orthodox, um, and you know, we're not going to say that there are there are six of them. There are a number of different schools, and, and we'll um, uh, describe them accordingly. But go with that basic uh, approach of dividing it up by schools, and then um, also divide by more kind of familiar philosophical topics. So you know, typically. Uh, substantive posts that, that anybody would make would have at least two categories on it. Um, they would say, you know, well, this is this is a post on um, mimosa ethics, so we categorize under mimosa and under ethics. And usually, there's more than more than one of each kind, but you know, that that way there there are ways for people to go in and, and find it. Um, so you know, if you're if you're interested in um, in the Indian logic, for example, you can click on the logic button, and you'll see specifically. The posts that have to do with logic. Um, so, uh, so those are part of our process for uh, creating the blog. Um, one of the lessons we learned in this process was, um, if you want the community's approval for a policy or a change, go negative option. Um, as in, we we wanted you know, we wanted it to be democratic. You know, we wanted we wanted people to have a, we wanted all the all the members of the the blog to have a say. Um, but we realized in order to do that, it's very important to Sort of propose something, sort of you know, th throw the proposal out there. Often, often like the three of us, uh, Matthew and Elisa and I, will kind of meet and say, "This is the thing we want to do," and then basically sort of put the proposal out there and say, "We're going to do this unless anybody objects." Mm -hmm. um, that that it's, it's a much more efficient way than trying to sort of actively solicit feedback and say, "Well, what do people think about this?" Because that because you know you often don't get many replies, and that can sort of drag on, and you never really know when you're kind of done with getting feedback. So, you know. Put it out there, and and if you get an objection, then you can have a conversation about it, and it'll probably be an interesting and lively conversation. But um, but typically, you know, people if if you say, well, we want to change it in this way, people are like, oh yeah, fine. Um, so you know, those are all part of, of making it effective. And and the other thing we've already sort of touched on a little bit is is to be distinct from what's already out there. Right. Um, this was a big thing that that helped us is that it was a, a distinctive subject matter. 
Um, most philosophy blogs are Western oriented. There aren't really many on, on India out there. Um, I remember my my dissertation advisor had mentioned to me several years ago as I was floating this idea that he was thinking about starting a, an Indian philosophy uh, blog as well with others and sort of seemed like it was kind of aimed for, for senior scholars. Um, and I think if that had happened, there wouldn't really have been so much of a niche for us to fill. But they never actually did that. So so we had this this space to, to fill. Um, and the other thing that Matthew sort of hinted at is that the, the best known philosophy blogs tend to be about the profession, more about content. Um, they're sort of sometimes gossipy. Uh, the, the lighter report is the best known um, new apps. Some of the sort of philosophy groups out there, um, they, they tend to be about you know, who got hired where and um, you know this, this professor who had the scandal of trying to sleep with a student and um, the, the, um, the, the sort of business of being a, an academic philosopher. And we wanted to be really focused on, on substance and content. Um, and I think that's, that's made us distinct. I mean, you know, there are occasional professional announcements, but that's really not what the, the blog is about or, or for. So the key question in all of this, and in some ways it's kind of what, I, what I've been leading up to is, so we screened the people that we wanted to contribute. And we, we sort of got, got this list of the people that we, we thought would be good and, and, get our, and we get our quality um, by having them contribute. But so the next question is, how do we get them to do it? Right? Because blogging is free labor. That, that, that is important. Um, 